Good morning, GCA. Good morning. Amen. I bring you greetings uh, from the saints at Marco Bible Fellowship. It is good to be back with you once again. I am honored once again uh, to be able to share with you, certainly on this uh, last youth, uh, younger generation Sunday of the year. It's really an honor for me. Seriously, I, I, I thank God for it. Um, over the years that I've come here, um, after the service, uh, folks would, you know, offer some words of encouragement, uh, which is much appreciated. But what I hear most often is folks would come to me and they would express appreciation because I seem not to be too long-winded. <laughs> you know? I don't know, I might have told you this story before. There was um, the two girls, uh, went to high school together, friends. Uh, one of them, uh, her father was a priest. The other one, her father was a pastor of a Baptist church. And they decided they would visit each other's houses of worship to just kind of see, you know, get to know each other a little better. So the first Sunday they went to the uh, church where the young lady's father was a priest. And so, you know, during the course of the service, uh, some young men walked down the aisle and they had candles. They, you know, they lit candles and she explained what that meant. And, uh, you know, then um, the, the guy walked down the aisle with the censer, swinging the incense. And the girl said, what did that mean? And she explained what that meant. And then the next Sunday, they went to the Baptist church. And at the beginning of the service, some deacons came down and they put some pillars down on the front. And she said, what's that about? And she explained that it was for prayer time. And then when her father, the preacher, got up to preach, he takes his watch off and looks at it to check the time. And he lays it on the pulpit. And the girl's friend said, what did that mean? And she was like, that don't mean nothing. <laughs> that don't mean nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, your time does mean a great deal to me. And so uh, we're going to give you what the Lord gave us, and uh, then we're going to be out of your way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to gather with uh, those of like precious faith and Lord, to, to lift up your name in praise and to fellowship with one another, to be encouraged, um, but also to hear from your word, Lord. And um, we, we pray, as we always do, that you would give unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that we, we might know what is the hope of your calling and what the, grit, what the riches of the glory of your inheritance is in the saints and the exceeding greatness of your power toward us who believe, according to the working of that power which you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead, set him at your own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. Thank you that you placed all things under his feet, made him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Speak to us and speak through us, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. When I was a young man growing up on the uh, mean streets of uh, South Philadelphia, we used to have, so you can, if you can put up that f uh, first slide, I'd appreciate it. Um, we used to have something that we, that we used to do when we wanted to uh, like kind of challenge somebody's courage, you know, or see where they were coming from. And we'd say this, I dare you. Now, it was usually something foolish sometimes even maybe illegal but that was the thing you know if we wanted to kind of see where somebody was at and test their courage we was we would say to them i, I dare you uh, and if that didn't work then we say i double dare you. <laughs> yeah and some of the older folks may remember this one if that didn't work we say i did double dare you anybody remember that <laughs> Yeah, well, we've chosen as a subject this morning, especially for our youth, dare to be different. Dare to be different. The foundational scripture that we're using in First Timothy, you don't have to turn to that because we're going to be someplace else for the remainder of our time together, but that scripture says that no one despise, don't let anybody look down on you because of your youth. And the way that you can avoid that, it says, is by being an example of the believer. And that's going to be my challenge to you today, to dare to be different. 
for being an example of the believer in word and in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. So I want you to turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of John, chapter 6. We're going to look at three individuals in the scripture, three young people in the scripture that dared to be different. John chapter 6. I'm going to begin reading at verse 4. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near, and Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he says to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. In verse 7, Philip answers and says, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them should have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus says, Make the people sit down. And there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Verse 11, And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost. We all know this story. It's a very, very familiar story. And most of the times when we teach or talk about this story, we kind of focus on what Jesus did, the miracle that Jesus performed, being able uh, to multiply something that really should not have been able to be multiplied. We often talk about what the disciples did. You know, I always say that, you know, we say that Jesus fed, fed, fed the 5,000, but the reality is Jesus provided the miracle, but the disciples did the actual work of distributing the food to the 5,000 people. And we all know, again, that was just men. So if you had 5,000 men, watch this. If you are a man here at, my, at, at uh, GCA, raise your hand. All the men, raise your hands. Okay, now all the women, raise your hands. Yeah, see, my experience in most churches that I go to, my experience is that the women outnumber the men. That's my experience. So if there were 5,000 men, there had to be at least 5,000 women, maybe more, and a couple thousand kids. So we could be talking about maybe 12,000 people that Jesus feeds with five loaves and two fish. And we, we, we always talk about that. But the one person that we don't really talk about too much is this little boy. I call him the lad with a lunch. Somebody say that. The lad with a lunch. Yeah, we, we don't talk about him too much. But I, there's some things I want us to consider as, as youth and certainly as adults also, but especially to the youth. We talk about daring to be different. I want you to look at some things about this lad with his lunch. Look there in verse 5. It says, Jesus lifted up his eyes, seeing a great multitude coming towards him. He said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And watch this in verse 6. Says he, but he said this to test him, watch this, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Jesus knew what he was going to do. Is it possible? See, again, see, Jesus was trying to teach Philip something. Is it possible that God wants to use you to show somebody his power? Does God want to use you and, and what you bring to the table to show somebody else his ability to meet others' needs. This young man, Jesus performed the miracle. The, the disciples distributed the food. But this lad with the lunch, watch this, he gave Jesus what he had. He gave Jesus what he had. Maybe ten to 12,000 people. I'm sure that in a crowd like that, this young man didn't stand out. You know, this is a young man that maybe his parents brought him or, or maybe they packed him a lunch, but his thing was, I want to go hear Jesus. 
And amongst all those people, I'm sure he did not stand out in the crowd, but even though you might feel like you don't stand out in the crowd, I, I want you to know this morning that God will use you to be a blessing to other people if you will dare to be different and just give him what you have. You might not think it's much, but little is much when God is in it. I'm sure when that young man left his house that day to go and hear Jesus, he had absolutely no idea how God was going to use him. My goodness, we still talk, we talk about him today. We're still talking about this young man, why? Because all he simply did was make available to Jesus what was in his hands. And it's interesting to note that this one miracle is recorded in all four Gospels. Jesus wanted us to know something about this young person. Look at verse 8. Uh, one of his disciples, uh, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, watch this, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they amongst so many? Now, I'm reading this, studying this, and a couple of questions begin to pop up in my mind. And one of them is, didn't nobody else bring no food? <laughs> the disciples said, all we can find is five loaves and a couple of fish. Now, I'm sure, that, I'm sure that there was somebody in this crowd that had probably heard Jesus teach before. And, um, you know, if you remember the Sermon on the Mount, that's 107 verses Jesus could go for a while. So I know somebody said, listen, man, we're going to see Jesus, man. We better bring some food, man, because this brother can preach a little bit. So my question is, if this is all they could find, did anybody, nobody else brought any food? Or was it that other people brought some food and it was like, you know, I just got enough for me and my family. You know, I got mine, you know, you get yours kind of thing. I mean, we don't know. But the reality is that amongst all of those people, this young man was singled out with these five loaves and a couple of fish. Yeah. Uh, here's another question. Look at verse 11. Jesus takes the loaves and he gives thanks and he distributes them to the, uh, to the disciples. It says that Jesus took the loaves. Now, I don't believe Jesus went to this young man and said, oh, excuse me, man, we need this. We need this food. Yeah, I don't believe that's what happened. Because I don't believe that Jesus will ever take from you what you are not willing to give him. You know what they call it? That's stealing. When you take from somebody something they don't want you to have, you know, they, they call that stealing. And see, that's, that's not Jesus' modus operandi. That's the devil. He has come to steal. Jesus is not going to take from you, young people, what you're not willing to give him. But if you will dare to be different and give him what you have, he will bless it, he will break it, and he will feed thousands. Look at the... Uh, here's, here's another question. Okay, so again, you got ten to 12,000 people. And they're trying to find enough food to feed these folks. And I'm saying, and that many people, how do you find this little boy? I don't think he said, I mean, how, how do you find him? Listen, if you are willing to give God, and God knows it, if you are willing, because it said Jesus knew what he was going to do. If you are willing to just give God what you have, he will, he'll find you. You may feel like you're lost in the crowd. You may feel like I'm not special. But I want to tell you this morning that if you are willing to give God what is in your hands, God will find you and he will make sure that he uses you to be a blessing to others. Lord, have mercy. You know, I thank God for the uh, opportunity to plant some of this seed in your life today. Lord knows if I could put it in a syringe and inject it directly into your veins, I would do it. But it just doesn't work that way. I don't want this to just be another message. I want you to understand that God is saying some things to you that will change your life if you will dare to be different. Yeah. Look at verse 9. There's a lad here who has five barley loaves, two fish, 
But what are they amongst so many? How is that going to, all those people, what is this little bit going to do? Watch this. It's not, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> it's not what you bring. It's who you bring it to. Ooh, Lord have mercy. Nobody else could have done what Jesus did with that little bit of food. It wasn't the amount of the food. It was who he brought it to. And again, you may not think you have a lot to offer. But I want to tell you that what it is that you have, if you bring it to Jesus, it's not about your ability. It is about your availability. And I'm telling you, God wants to work a miracle through you. Yeah, the lad with the lunch. Now I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. Another very, very familiar story. I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Look at this in verse 3. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were, the prophet, were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. First we had the lad with the lunch. Now we have a maiden with a message. Yeah. And again, you know, we know this story. We always talk about Naaman and how even though he was a great man, the Bible said he was a leper. Uh, we know about leprosy. We know that there was no cure for it except a miracle. Um, and we talk about, you know, Elijah the prophet. And we talk about how Naaman had to go down into this dirty water in order to get clean. But we don't ever really think about this young lady who's so prominent in this story. And like the little boy that we talked about with the lunch, we don't even know her name. But we're still talking about her today. There's some things we do know about her, even though we don't know her name. She's a slave girl. The Syrians had come and on raids and they took this little girl away and, you know, you know, in my spiritual eye, I, I sometimes try to see what this might have been like. Uh, you know, this little girl's at home and she's asleep and all of a sudden she hears a ruckus and she's awakened by uh, some soldier grabbing her by the arm and snatching her away. I know y'all feel me. Taking her away from her home, away from all this familiar to her, taking her to some other land. She was a slave. And then going to work in this man's house as a maid. But watch this. She did not allow her circumstance to dictate who she was. And she did not allow her circumstance, watch this, to keep her from telling somebody what God could do. Lord, have mercy. Ah, Yeah. I'll tell you something else we know about it too. Verse 2 says that she was from the land of Israel. This girl knew something about God. Yeah, she had a foundation. Uh, she didn't let her circumstance uh, define her, and God opened up a door for her to be able to make a difference. She knew something. Look, look, look around. This is, this is Germantown Christian Assembly. <laughs> this is where you're able to come and to worship and, and, and to learn and, 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 and to get a foundation, and you know something about the Lord. You come here week after week, and you hear the song sung, and you hear the word preached, Dare to be different, and even in your circumstance, don't be afraid to tell somebody else what God can do. Yeah. Verse 3 says that she goes to her mistress, and she says, If only my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria, for he would heal his leprosy. See, she... Even though she was in a bad situation, she cared about somebody else's situation and she wasn't afraid to tell somebody what God could do. Now, some of you young people, you might know what 
typology is. It's like one thing is an example of the other. And in scripture, leprosy is an example for sin. It's like a type of sin. See, leprosy, there was no cure for it except a miracle. There is no cure for sin except through the miraculous saving grace of Jesus Christ. And in the same way, she would say to this man in the physical sense, listen, God is able to heal you from this physical condition. We young people cannot be afraid to tell others that God is able to save you from your sin. Dare to be different. Put that on Facebook. You know, instead of where you went on vacation, you know, or, or a picture of your food. Dare to be different. Put that on Facebook. That God is able to save you from the guttermost to the uttermost. We don't know a name. And watch this. We don't even really know what happened to her after this episode. But we do know that Naaman got his cleansing. He got his miracle. And he even said to Elijah, he wanted to give Elijah a gift. Now, I, I, I mean, I can't prove it, but I got to believe that this young woman opened her mouth and as a result of it, Naaman was able to be healed. I believe he was grateful to this young lady and I don't know what he might have given her. He might have given her her freedom. I don't know. All I'm saying is that I know that God blessed her because she wasn't afraid to open her mouth. She was a maiden with a message. You've got a message today. Even if that message is only I was lost, and now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I mean, if you don't have anything else, you have a personal testimony of what God did for you. I love teaching to the masses. You know, I, I love you know, those, those, those large meetings, but some of the most effective ministry in the world is one person going to another person and telling them, here's where I was and here's where I am now, and it's because of Jesus. Dare to be different. Don't be afraid to let your circumstances not dictate to you what God can do for others. Yeah. So we had the uh, lad with the lunch. We got the maid with the message. Now turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to see the shepherd with a stone. Again, you know the story, 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to begin reading at verse uh, 32. David, you know... David's come down and he sees the war, go, well, he sees the quote-unquote battle. He sees uh, Goliath selling wolf tickets and the children of Israel just sitting there buying them. And so David says to Saul, let no man's heart fail in uh, verse 30, 32. Because of him, your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul says to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you are a youth. And he a man of war from his youth, verse 34. But David says to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose up against me, I caught it by its beard, struck and killed it. Verse 36, your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David says in verse 37, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul, watch this in verse 38, Saul clothed David with his armor, put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. In verse 39, David fastens the sword to his armor. He tries to walk for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. And David took them off. Lord, have mercy. Now, I don't want to focus on the fight. We all know about the fight. I don't want to focus on that. Uh, but what I do want to focus on is what David says there in verse 39. David says, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So he took them off. 
Here's where, if I could, I would ask all the adults to leave the room. Because I want to say something to the youth that I know some of the adults uh, might not necessarily understand. But here's what I want to say to you. Don't let anybody else sell you on they armor. You got to fight. This may not be good English. You got to fight the way you know how to fight. I remember years ago when Christian rap was beginning to be popular, uh, you know, and I was like, man, I don't know. First of all, you can't even have all you understand what they're saying and, you know, rap music. I just felt it was not a redeemable idiom of music. But then in 2003, a group uh, came out and they had, a, they had a rap song. And the first, the first verse of that song went like this. Advocates of the theocratic rule. And I was like, oh, you got me. <laughs> advocates of the theocratic rule. It was talking about those who promote the reign of God in their lives and on the earth. And so I had to begin to ask myself, was I asking others to fight in my armor? You got to fight like you know how to fight. Dr. James Murray, one of the pastors that Philadelphia Bible Fellowship. He's been here before. You guys have heard him preach? Man, I can't, I can't do that. He's got that voice. You know, and, and he's, he, he's, he's, he's a doctor. He's intelligent. And everything he says sounds so profound. I, I can't do that. But you know what I can do? I can fight like I know how to fight. Pastor Brian Grant, he, he got that Jamaican accent that... It's, you know, it's, it's pleasant to listen to. I just got a regular old voice. <laughs> but I can fight like I know how to fight. See, you know, one of, the, one of the things God gives to me, I like alliteration. You know, the path of God, the presence of God, the pleasures of God. I think it helps folks to remember. The lad with the lunch, the maid with the message, uh, the shepherd with the stone. You know, that's, that's how I fight. You know, Pastor Tom was asking me, how do you do that? And I was like, well, you know, it's just a gift, man. What can I tell you? <laughs> I, can't, I can't teach you, you know. But that, that's my armor. And one of the things that sometimes keep us as, as young people from fighting is the expectations of others. I can't pray like that. You know, I can't sing like that. I can't play an instrument. Fight like you know how to fight. David was a shepherd... And in order for him to defeat Goliath, he had to fight Goliath like a shepherd. If David had went out there in Saul's armor, he would have got killed. But David understood something that I want you to understand today. Fight the way God has called you to fight. Nobody else may understand it. Nobody else may get it. But if it is the equipment that God has given you, God will empower you to do what David did and go against all odds. And I'm going to close with this. Usually when you hear the story of David and Goliath, people talk about, you know, somebody going against all the odds. You know, it's like the little guy versus the big guy. It's like somebody who was, you know, outnumbered or somebody who was lesser than the other person. And the reality is that is not the story of David and Goliath because the reality is God had already told David, listen, if they're your enemy, they're my enemy. And I want you to know that Goliath never had a prayer. He was defeated before he even got up in the morning. So if you will dare to be different and not worry about other people's expectations and not anybody else tell you how to do what you know God has called you to do. I mean, yeah, we, we all get instruction and we all learn from others, but learn to be comfortable in your own spiritual skin. And like that lad with the stone, man, you go out there in the name of the Lord. And I'm telling you, young folks, if you dare to be different, God... Y y 
I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Just like that little lad with his lunch and that little maiden with her message and this little boy with a stone. I'm sure none of them knew how God was going to use them. And they're still an example for all of us today. So I want to encourage you on this last younger generation of the year. Dare to be different. I dare you. I double dare you. I D double dare you. Our Father and God, we thank you, Lord, for this time in your word. We pray that it's been practical. We pray that it's something, Lord, that they'll be able to go and, 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 and chew on, Lord, and swallow it and then bring it back up and chew on it some more and, and take it back down. And, Lord, just continue to regurgitate that word, Lord, until it becomes a part of them. So I desire for them to know today, Lord, that you don't desire anybody to look down on them because of, of their age but that they can be an example of the believer in everything that they do. And like this lad with his lunch and this maiden with a message and this shepherd with a stone, you, you want to use them in mighty ways, ways that they can't even imagine so that you can impact those in whom they have contact with. Again, we praise you and bless you for your word and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.